Welcome to the Accelerate Church television broadcast. We are so glad that you are tuning in with us today. We believe today's message is going to strengthen and encourage you. So get your Bibles ready as Pastor Jeremy File is teaching today's message. Creation proves there's a creator. And folks, it wasn't a big bang. People say, oh, there's a big bang to happen. I don't know. I, I've always liked fireworks. I've noticed now my boys coming up. And even my girls like a little bit of fireworks. The girls kind of like the sparklers. They're more pretty. The boys like the bang. And some of you grown men are looking like I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about you too. <laughs> Truth is you like those fireworks too. But see, I never did take one of my friends, G.I. Joe men. We used to do this. Put an M60 even better was an M90 they used to have back then. I don't even know if they make those now. But, a, that, you know, it's basically just a, a black cat on steroids, if you know what that is. Yeah. We would tie two of them on those G.I. Joe men. We'd fuse them together, light it, step back. I'm not telling you to do this. I'm telling you what I did as a kid. It was always fun to put those on the ant bed, too. But anyway, never once did I put it on an ant bed or tie it on the G.I. Joe man. And order came out of the explosion. Disorder, dismembered G.I. Joe men were everywhere. Ants, carcasses everywhere. There was not order out of a Big Bang. Are you listening? You need to know this. Because, I mean, look, I, all you had to do is flip on the television for a little bit and you're going to hear somebody. About 400 million years ago, there was a huge bang. And, you know, they just start, they put whatever years they want on there. 40 million years, not 400. Okay, well, still... How do you know that? You see what I'm saying? Well, why are you even focused on that? You're here now, and you didn't come out of just a big bang. Well, I won't get into it, but let's just say this. God created heaven and earth. And how did he create? He spoke, and the Holy Spirit moved. And he created us that same way, and we're created beings made in his image, the only created being in his image. That's why you're not on the level of a dog. I know you love your dogs. I love my dogs. But, but my dogs are not near as important as my children. Right? They're not near as important as human life. Human life is important because human life is what's made in the image of God. So it's superior to all creation that God created. But we're still a creation. So who are you to rise up against your creator and think you know more than the creator? Wow. These are things not in my notes. Somebody needs to hear them, obviously. Started this series last Sunday. Are we there yet? This is already part three. We have Wednesday night service. I can't re-preach those services. If you didn't uh, hear those, you need to get them for free. Ask for the CD in the lobby. Or get our app and listen for free. Or go to our website, accelerate.church.cc. Let me just start out today and tell you this. Newsflash, Jesus is coming. <laughs> Don't get tired of hearing this. The signs are all around, and I compared it last Sunday to a trip I recently took with my family down to the Texas coast, and we were going to Corpus Christi specifically, and if you leave Amarillo and go the fastest way, you're going to go in such a manner that you do not see one sign for Corpus Christi until you get to San Antonio, which is a larger place than Corpus Christi. So we stopped and stayed the night at San Antonio, but uh, all I had to do was get out on the highway and look for that sign, Corpus Christi, this way. I went that way. And on that way, I started seeing more and more, more frequently as I got closer, signs about Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi. I had gone all that time without seeing any. Then I started seeing sign after sign after sign after sign after sign after sign until Mama said, my wife said to the kids in the back in the van with the TV on, turn the television off. We're here. The theme of this series is turn the TV off. We're here. <laughs> all the distractions in life, all that device that you like to get on, turn it off. We're here. You don't need to entertain yourself now. We're here. Souls are at stake. What do you think the enemy is going to Fight with everything he has to get you to stop now. You've come this far by faith. Don't stop now. Keep going. Look at your neighbor. Say, keep going. The signs are all around. The single greatest sign of where we are on God's calendar is the nation of Israel. Let me give you a Bible for why I say that. 
Tell me this morning, thank God for the Word. word. Now tell the Lord like you mean it. Thank God God. for the Word. Matthew chapter 24, verse 32, Jesus speaking. He says, now learn this parable from the fig tree. You got to pay attention to what Jesus is saying. Learn this parable from the fig tree. And I showed you, I believe it was last Sunday, that Matthew 24, he was talking to his disciples privately. That's how the chapter starts. He didn't change that. I know I'm preaching this publicly, but you got to. Sometimes this helps you to remember. People have asked me, "What's the difference in Matthew 24 and Luke uh, 17 or chapter 21?" And here's the difference: Luke, he was saying it publicly. Matthew 24, he was saying privately. So he's telling disciples, those that were going to follow his word, no matter what. Remember, they'd already made the cut. John chapter six, verse 66. John 6, 6, 6 says, "Many of his disciples followed him no longer." Don't let that mark 666 be on your life where you no longer walk with him. Amen. You walk all the way to the end. Do you hear me? Learn this parable from the fig tree. So Jesus is telling you, here is the greatest sign that we can look at in this end time hour and we can learn something from it. The fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and it puts forth leaves, you know That summer is near. Verse 33. So you also, when you see all these things that he just talked about, took up, you know, almost 30 verses there to talk about it, know that it is near. What? The end. It is at the doors. Well, this stirred me deeply. Jesus actually gave us a lot of insight that a lot of his followers don't see right now. What? What? Israel is compared to a fig tree. Let let me show you why I say that. It's not just my opinion. Hosea chapter 9. See, this is like Bible school here, but if you write this down, this will get you excited too because of how close we are to the end. Hosea 9.10. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. Look at this part. This is the Holy Spirit. This is the Lord speaking through his prophet Hosea. I saw your father's as the first fruits on the fig tree in its season. Now there's other chapters and verses I could take you to, but this should be sufficient for you to draw the parallel and understand that Israel is compared to a fig tree. It says they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves to that shame. They became an abomination like the thing they have loved. I thought about not reading that, but I thought, isn't that amazing? That God's people became an abomination like the thing they loved. You better watch where your affections go in this end time moment. This is very, very important. This is the worst time of all times to allow an affection for the things of this world to grow. You've got to cut off those affections for the world. See, those that are Christ have set their affection on things above, not on things on this earth, Colossians says. But catch this. The signs are all around. Are we there yet is the series here. And I'm letting you know the number one big daddy sign is the nation of Israel. Well, what am I talking about? Israel, they did not exist. If you were to read your Bible and you lived before 1948, they were not a nation. You knew that as Palestine. But in 1948, they became a nation again. I find that interesting in light of what Jesus said about the fig tree shooting forth its branch. In other words, that fig tree was there and it looked dead. Interestingly enough, in Mark 11, Jesus cursed the fig tree and it died from the roots. But then he talks about it shooting forth back its branch. That's exactly what has happened here in Israel. I didn't mean to lose you with that. I want you to catch this. Israel is like a fig tree. Do you got that? So 1948, they became a nation. Then they recaptured their capital, Jerusalem, in 1967. That moment is a marker that summer is not. Translation, Jesus' return is at the door. Hey, greater. I said greater. Greater is he that's in me. One of the greatest, I believe, battles and fights 
for the everyday Christian is to shake off this world because all it does is make you dull. Makes me dull. Everything on this planet, even some of the good things, it's all meant. Talk about marriage, talk about kids, talk about jobs, talk about money. It's all meant to bring you out of the spirit realm and rub the world in your face. You got to do this. You're responsible for that. You got to figure this out. Oh my God, what am I going to do? What is it that God told you and me to get out of our life, cut off that friendship with that pagan, that heathen, that hell-bound sinner, cut this thing, this habit, this thing out of your life, and you got rid of everything but your one The first pastor, James, talked about it. I want you to look at James chapter 5. Say it one more time. Thank God for the word. James chapter 5 and verse 8 says, you also be patient. And that word means stay consistent. <laughs> Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Well, I mean, that's, that's so clear. The coming of the Lord is at hand. This was written 2,000 years ago. There needed to be another 2,000 years past because a day with the Lord is as 1,000 years, 1,000 years as a day. And there's about 6,000 years of human history now. When this was written, there was about 4,000 years of human history. So we needed two more days to pass. Have you ever had something coming up on your calendar and you needed two more days to pass? There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you know, I'm, they should live. And they did. James did. He lived with this edge about his Christianity that he believed Jesus was coming. In fact, James that wrote this was a powerful man. He was raised in the same household as Jesus. Mary and Joseph were his mom and dad. Jesus was virgin born, which means Joseph was not his biological dad. God was. If you don't believe in a virgin birth, you can't be born again or go to heaven. Can I be that plain about it? I just, I like, I'm a guy, I just cut to the end. You know, I, I can tell you all the whys, but I just like to cut right to the end and tell you, you don't believe in a virgin birth, you got big problems. Because you don't have anyone that hung on the cross that could pay for your sins. But he did, he took your place, the Lamb of God. Well, James was raised in the same household. And historians tell us, the Bible doesn't record this, but historians will tell you, and more than one, has confirmed this, that James did not believe Jesus was the Messiah, which is very common when God calls you to do something. Those closest to you can struggle with familiarity because you are a human, right? Now, here's the difference. Jesus made no mistakes. That'd be tough to be James and be born in a house where the older brother never made one mistake, wouldn't it? So maybe there was a little bit of something going on in his heart there. But after the resurrection... What you find out is James got serious about God. He ended up being martyred for the sake that his half-brother was the Messiah. He went hard for the Lord. See, men of God aren't weaklings. I get so tired of that mindset. These guys weren't weak when they died in the name of Jesus. They had their heads cut off. They were sawed in half. Lit as lamp post with oil. They didn't go weak for the Lord. They went with everything they had. They took him on the temple one day and he stood up on the roof. And they, the Pharisees thought, we're going to capture him. We're going to get him now. Uh, tell us about this Jesus. They thought they could get him for blasphemy, see. And he said, <laughs> basically, I'm going to paraphrase it, put it in our modern day vernacular. The king is coming. Look to the clouds. Well, they all started shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. The Pharisees freaked out. That's not what they thought was going to happen. And one historian says they pushed him off the top of the temple. They didn't die that way. Well, these guys weren't weak. They were willing to face whatever they had to face for the truth to continue to spread. Are you? Now, here we are now at the end. God has raised us up. No, there might not be a book of, I already mentioned Larry, so there might not be a book of Larry in the Bible. But God's keeping, he's keeping tabs. And let me tell you something. I believe the book of Acts is still being written. And I believe that if you are faithful to the end, you might find your name in that someday. Glory to God. 
But look what he says. Be patient. Get some consistency about you. Don't freak out when pressure comes. Don't bow the knee when they say we're going to throw you in the fire if you don't bow your knee. You just be patient. And having done all, continue to stand. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. Verse 9. Do not grumble against one another, brethren. Do I really need to tell Accelerate Church? Yes, I do. Anytime you see brethren or beloved in the New Testament, it's written directly to you. You can put your name on the verse. So this is very interesting. The first pastor says, hey, brother in Christ, sister in Christ, don't grumble against one another. What's, what's the enemy going to try to do here at the end? You tell me. Grumble. Lest you be condemned. You might not want to look that word up. Actually, you might want to. I said not because some of you, you don't believe what it actually says there. Can I tell you, I'm going to read it as, as what it means. You ready for this? Buckle your seatbelt. Don't get mad at me. Go study for yourself. Don't grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be damned. <laughs> See how stout that is? Somebody said, did you just cuss? No, the Bible didn't cuss either. Damnation is a passing of sentence that the judge of the universe is going to drop the gavel one of these days. And if you're not under the blood of Jesus and your faith in the blood, so you got some works that show that you got faith, you can't just say, I got faith in the blood. You got to have some works that match it because faith without works is dead. So you got faith in the blood or that gavel's coming down on you. Now pay attention close. Here's what, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pace myself, but pay close attention. James, the first pastor, said something you've got to catch. He said, behold, that means looky here. The judge, with a capital J, is standing at the door. The judge is at the door. This is why these guys turned the world right side up. Because they lived with this tick about them. The judge is at the door. Jesus is coming. It might be today. How would you live if you thought it was today? How would you live if you thought Jesus was coming today? Think about it. Would you still act hard up in church? Or would you say, Lord, I'm yours. I mean, good. Now we're singing it. Pastor's over here yelling at you to do it. And you still, no. Hey, the judge is at the door. I don't care. It's about to get harsh then for you. Because when the judge shows up, judgment's coming. Are we there yet? Write it down. We're here. Let's look at the fig tree for a minute. It's the number one sign. And what, what did Jesus say? You're at the door, and I had to share that with you because in, inside of me, see, when you know the word, this is what happens. I read that, that Jesus said it's even at the doors, and so what's popping off in me? James talked about the door. I went and looked it up, and sure enough, it's about the coming of the Lord. He was repeating what Jesus said. It's at the door. The judge is at the door. Behold, you better, you better stop your grumbling. You better stop your complaining. The judge is standing at the door. And what happens when the judge hits that door? All rise. That's what happens. You ever been in a courtroom? I was there for a traffic ticket. But, well, it's been more than 20 years ago now. I've been married 21 years. It's been a long time. I haven't had a ticket since I've been married that I remember. They all were before marriage. I only had two. Neither one was I actually speaking. But anyway... I went to stand before the judge. The judge says he comes in there and he expects respect at a county level for a traffic ticket. And I think about the judge of the universe with a capital J standing at the door. Well, I tell you, it's time to rise up and be who God called you to be. On the second and fourth Sunday nights of every month, we have Life Links. We gather together with like-minded believers and discuss the current series that Pastor Jeremy is preaching. We have food, we laugh together, we pray together, and we build those godly relationships with our brothers and sisters within the church. We would love for you to join us for Life Links. You can find a list of all of our groups along with their locations on our app, our website, or just stop by the desk in the lobby. We have someone there ready to help you find the perfect LifeLink group. There are many other signs I want to talk about. One of them so just crazy is the predatory bird situation. I just want to mention this. 
the population and migration to Israel is astounding. There's a German journalist named Thomas Krumenacker who witnessed Israel's bird migration, and he called Israel's 500 million bird population, quote, are you ready for this? The world's eighth wonder. That's what he said. Now, this guy doesn't know Bible. I happen to know Bible. So when I found that this guy wrote a book, and he called it The World's Eighth Wonder, and he's talking about the population of predatory birds in Israel, I'm thinking, now, where is this in the Bible? Well, Ezekiel chapter 39. I want you to look at this. Verse 17. Aren't you glad you came today? It says here, And as for you, son of man, thus says the Lord God, Speak to every sort of bird and to every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves and come. Gather together from all sides to my sacrificial meal, which I am sacrificing for you. A great sacrificial meal on the mountains of Israel that you may eat flesh and drink blood. Now to most Christians, we're like, okay, what on earth is that talking about? Well, the Bible explains itself. You see, this is a prophecy about the battle of all battles that is yet to come on this planet. Yeah, that battle I referred to that was a couple chapters before this, Ezekiel 37 and 38, that's a big battle, but that's not the battle of all battles, Armageddon is coming. This is repeated in the book of Revelation from Ezekiel 39 all the way at the end. If you go to Revelation chapter 19, I have it on the screen here, verse 17 John's writing, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He said, then I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried out with a little wimpy voice. Now, see, when God's doing something, it ain't wimpy. Get that out of your, block that out of your mind. With a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly. All the what? That fly in the midst of heaven. Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. What? Verse 18, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. Hey, something now I just want you to take note of. These birds are already over there multiplying. They've already migrated over there. Now they're just multiplying, getting ready. Because one thing I know is this. There's got to be a seven-year period of time that I've already preached in this series about that Daniel prophesied. And so you think about birds, and I don't know all this. Miss Cassie might know more than I would know about this because she studied animals in college. But I can tell you this. Birds are multiplying now. They're over there. And now there's going to be even more than 500 million if you add another seven, eight years to the mix here. Or a few more. We don't know the exact day. But let's read more in Revelation. Are you still alive out there? Revelation 19, 19. I saw the beast and the kings of earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. So get this. This is the Antichrist, the false prophet, everyone on the planet that's had the mark of the beast that hasn't died is gathered to take on God now. See, it's never going to be enough for the Antichrist. Finally, he's going to say, I'm going to take God on. Because you know what? It's tough when you're facing 100-pound hailstones hitting you. And he says, I'm going to take God on now. Let's go. I tell you what, this is the battle, the battle of all battles. Yeah. 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 Verse 20, Revelation 19. Then the beast was captured. The beast, yeah, ain't nothing, Antichrist, captured. And with him, the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those that received the mark of the beast. And those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. They're going to be cast alive straight up. Bloop, straight to hell. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of Jesus. Who sat on the horse. Now look at this part. Look at this part. We've shouted on that part before. But look at this part. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. We're here. The birds are going to eat. 
By the way, this will be a good time since I hardly ever get to talk about this. I want to bring this up. If you hear someone talking to you about the rapture of the church, even someone I love and respect, I don't know what all they believe, but if you hear someone preaching about the rapture of the church and they bring up Luke 17, one will be in the bed. In fact, let's just look at it. Well, you know, one will be in the bed, one taken. And they're saying that's the rapture. That ain't the rapture. I want you to look at it, Luke 17. I had to put this in there because I hardly ever get to cover this. But Luke 17, verse 34, Jesus says, I tell you, in that night, there will be two men in one bed. By the way, men was added by the translators. Somebody's built a doctrine on that. Well, that's homosexuals. Well, men was just added by the translators. That doesn't mean it was in the Greek. I wasn't talking about homosexuality. It just means two in the bed, two people in bed. The one will be taken, the other left. You're going to hear somebody preach this like this is rapture verses, but this ain't rapture. This is something you don't want to be a part of. There is a translation that happens, move from one spot to another, but this ain't the kind you want to be a part of. I tell you, in that night, there'll be two in one bed. One will be taken, the other will be left. Two, women was added by the translators. It's not in the Greek. So two will be grinding together. That means working on a, like a grinding that grinds up grapes or, or grain, right? The one will be taken, the other left, Luke 17, 36. Two, men was added by the translators, it's not there. Two will be in the field. The one will be taken, the other left. How many have heard that mentioned as rapture verses before? Just be honest. Well, I could raise both hands. I've heard that a lot. But that's not what is being said here. Because the disciples in verse 37 said to Jesus, where, Lord? In other words, where will the one be taken? He said, wherever that body is, the eagles will be gathered together. These predatory birds. I'm just telling you the signs are all around. Lord, help me get all this out. Why in the world would I say that's a rapture verse? Jesus is talking about the battle of Armageddon, not the rapture of the church. So that might be a revelation for some of you. My point is this. The signs that the birds have been gathering in Israel is huge. It's huge. I mean, the Bible's talking all about it. Well, that does conclude today's television broadcast. But if you would like to hear more from Pastor Jeremy File, we invite you to head over to our website at acceleratechurch.cc and click on the media tab. There you will find every sermon that Pastor Jeremy has preached for your convenience. If you are in the Amarillo area, we would love to meet you in person. We are located at 4400 South Crockett here in Amarillo, and our service times are Sunday morning at 10 a.m. and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. If you're not from Amarillo, we would still love to hear from you. You can email us at info at acceleratechurch.cc or give us a call. We want to know how can we pray for you? Where are you watching and tuning in from? We are so glad that you tuned in with us today.